Minister of National Security, Dr. The Honorable Horace Chang, Commissioner of Police, Major General Anthony Anderson, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Damian King. I'm the Executive Director of the Caribbean Policy Research Institute. There is a, there is a growing sense of confidence in this country in which we live. And it's a confidence, I think, that reflects our ability to, to seem to take on our big problems. Many of us in the room will remember when our elections were marred by distrust and shenanigans and violence. But two years ago, we had a general election which was settled by a single seat in which the difference was a couple of hundred votes. And nobody expressed any concern about what was going to happen the following day. We all accepted it as a fair result. We have so much confidence in our elections now, and others have so much confidence in our elections that our election adv electoral advice is requested by other countries. Six years ago, Jamaica had the highest debt service cost of any country in the world as a percentage of GDP. Then we balanced our budget from $70 billion worth of deficit to a balanced budget in one year flat. After that, that debt that was the costliest in the world has now come down by a third. All problems that we thought were beyond us. News came out last week that according to the World Bank, Jamaica is now the fifth easiest place in the world to start a business. We have demonstrated a capacity to address and fix big problems. Well, we haven't fixed crime. Crime is a big problem. But there are countries that fix crime. There are many examples in the world of spectacular rates of crime that have come down to what is reasonably to expect in any country or any city. In Australia, the victimization survey shows that crime has fallen by half over the last 20 years. In one of the most violent places in the world, which is Cali, Colombia, where the murder rate used to be 120 per 100,000. It has come down to, I think the most recent data has it under 20 per 100,000. So we know that crime is fixable. So the reasoning is that if we have the capacity to fix big problems, and crime is a fixable problem, then there's no reason to think that we can't fix it here. And that is the attitude that CAPRI, the Caribbean Policy Research Institute, is bringing to its project to try to have something to say, to try to support our capacity to understand Jamaica's crime problem and to help our security forces and our security policymakers in addressing this problem. We can indeed fix it here. We need to look at a few things. We need to pay attention to, to the location of crime. Location meaning you know, in a multidimensional sense, where it takes place, when it tends to take place, what are the circumstances under which it takes place, what are the associated correlated factors. We need to gather data on that and intervene there. We certainly need to understand what are the fundamental drivers of crime at any point in time and violence. And we're doing some research in that area as well. And sort of the third element that we're trying to get a handle on is what is the 
institutional context of crime fighting, of crime control and crime prevention, in which this, is, this activity is taking place. And it is that last part that brings our focus on uh, the police force and how it ought to be reformed. That's what this report that Capri is presenting today is about, and that is where it fits into the overall picture. We're looking at how to reform the police force, something which we know that the government and the commissioner are greatly exercised about at the moment. We have previously shared the results of Capri's findings in the consultative process towards the new act for the JCF. But our purpose here today is to share it with you and to get your feedback. We, in, in, in preparing this report, we collaborated with the Institute for Criminal Justice and Security at the University of the West Indies, which, without which, you know, as a partner, the work that we do would not have any credibility. This is, Capri's role is to, is to provide critical support to public policy. And if the area of crime and security is now the most pressing area of public policy, then this is why we are, we are playing this role. After the presentation and the panel discussion, we're going to have a question and answer period and to facilitate the smooth running of the Q&A, we're going to be using an electronic platform. We're gonna be using a platform called Slido. And so we're going to be asking you, if you have a smartphone, to please go on the App Store or, the, or Google Play and download the Slido app, S-L-I-D-O. The instructions are on the screen. Once you download the Slido app and you open it, you enter the event code Capri. And then you have two jobs after that. You have a question, you put it on, put it on the app. Even if you don't have a question, you can look and see the questions that others have posted and vote on whether you want that question answered. And the questions that get the most votes the questions that you think are most pressing and want to be answered are the ones that are going to be answered. Presuming they are sufficiently polite. <laughs> they can be challenging, but we would rather if they be polite, or at least express politely. All of this work that we are doing to produce a series of reports that is going to help to inform the policymaking process on crime and security. It's possible because of the support that we are getting from the UK's Department for International Development. And I want to give more than the sort of, the usual sponsor big up at this point because working with the people at DFID in Jamaica over the last year or so has been a truly enlightening experience for us at Capri because it is clear that their support is not towards checking a box to say we have done some things in Jamaica, but the level of commitment that in the conversations we have had with them and in how demanding they have been of us, it is clear that their commitment is to ensuring that there is meaningful improvement in Jamaica in this critical policy area. And, and, and we, have, we have been able to exercise a degree of freedom and creativity in carrying out the exercise because they haven't come to us and said, well, we need you to do it this way or we need you to do this particular piece of research. It has been true support and I think it's going to help us to come out with a better project and to inform better policy. And this is a perfectly good time to ask uh, David Osborne of DFID to come and say a few words.
take the opportunity to simply say protocols have been observed. Good evening. I'm already very excited about this, this slider idea, but I'm slightly worried it will be used to hold me to account at some point. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me here today. I'm delighted to be here for this discussion on the future of policing in Jamaica. For those of you who don't know me very well, I'm the head of the UK's Department for International Development in Jamaica. And simply put, the job of my department is to help Jamaica manage its most pressing development challenges. And for many years, my department has worked in Jamaica supporting three areas, which I think most people will agree are the most pressing development challenges. Climate and disaster resilience, economic growth, and governance and security. Our support primarily comes in the provision of grant aid, which we tend to provide directly to our government partners, the ministries, departments, and agencies. And our funding tends to be spent on operations by those partners, service delivery, and technical assistance in particular. And critically, our partnership only really works when we're enabling Jamaican leaders to deliver changes that they see need to be made. I've always spoken very honestly to anybody who's asked about our track record of supporting the JCF in Jamaica. For a number of years, we provided direct support to the JCF. And whilst that support delivered some results, it was clear to us that at its heart, the organization was not substantively changing. For us, in any field that we work, the signs of a healthy organization are ones that recruit the best, promote the top performers, eject the poor performers, an organization that's trusted and liked, which welcomes accountability and transparency. Disliked, distrusted, accused of political bias, corruption and human rights abuses, and suffering from high rates of death in service. These were common and justified accusations thrown at the UK's Royal Ulster Constabulary in the 1990s. The RUC were charged with policing in Northern Ireland and were unable to operate in many communities without support from the military. There are numerous excellent reports written in Jamaica by Jamaican leaders be the academics or officials from government commissions on the JCF. And those reports highlight significant strengths, including the number of highly committed, passionate and caring JCF officers who are willing to put their lives at risk and work all hours to support the communities they work in and their country. And those reports also echo some of the challenges once thrown at the UK's Royal Ulster Constabulary. The Jamaican government was committed to drafting a new act looking at the future of policing in Jamaica, an action which seems to have wide support in the country. The Right Act can enable those committed, passionate and skilled police working so hard to deliver change. It can tap into and unleash the desire in many communities for a successful police service. In the UK, the Royal Ulster Constabulary no longer exists. It is now the Police Service Northern Ireland. It's rebranded, its recruitment has transformed and it now represents the communities it serves. It's no longer the most dangerous police force in the world in which to work, and is now one of the safest. That change was driven by a new act, informed and supported by all parts of the political spectrum and all communities. And it's for that reason that we're delighted to support this study and the conversation on the Future Police Act. Based on our experience, both in the UK and worldwide, where we support police transformation, the recommendations of this report appear very sensible, and I would particularly endorse the call for greater dialogue and consultation on the content. A new act for us is not just an opportunity for a new legal framework. The process offers an opportunity to change public opinion and gain support, so improving the operating environment for all police going forward. As I said before, where Jamaican leaders, where Jamaica has a vision, and drive to improve, my department can and wants to help you deliver on that change. We stand ready to provide support to a vision for police service which will make a difference to the people of Jamaica. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. 
Okay, apparently I give you more work to do than you actually need to do. I'm advised that you don't have to download the app. You just need to go to slido.com, as it said on the screen. <laughs> so just go to slido.com, put in Capri as the event code, and you are good to go. You can start putting in questions from now. Reforming the Jamaican police. Our major presentation is to be delivered by Professor Tony Harriet, who is the director of the Institute for Criminal Justice and Security here at the University of the West Indies. Professor. Uh, thank you, Chair and colleague. I want to forego um, any extended formalities. Uh, you all have been welcomed, recognized by name, um, uh, but I'm going to ask you to just permit me two exceptions. One, of course, is the Commissioner of Police, uh, Major General Anthony Anderson. Um, it would be inappropriate for me to make extended remarks about transforming JCF without recognizing him by name at this stage of my presentation. And uh, the second, of course, is Minister Chan. Um, he's first in the picking order, but I've named him last because I need to, in the interest of transparency, just make a declaration um, about Minister and I we're both Cornwallians, went to school at the same time. Uh, he was actually my head boy. And I think I can say with utmost honesty um, that at school you wouldn't believe it, but he was a model Cornwallian. <laughs> Excelled in academic life of the school, exhibited clear leadership tendencies from then, and of course was made head boy. Um, so as a Cornwallian, I'm indeed proud of him. Um, so good evening to you all. Um, <coughs> now, uh, Damien began on a very optimistic note, and I want to also begin on an optimistic note by pointing out to you that there has been a shift in the debate about crime control in recent times. Not sure if you have noticed it, but up until recent times, we pretty much had a runaway violent crime problem. And the discussion was about how to control it, how to bring it under control. And that was the debate for 20 plus, perhaps 30 years, right? If you go back to even the election of 1972, when you look at the big headlines, it was about runaway violent crime. And the campaign was about which party would take what measures to bring it under control. Out of that, you had gone court and so forth. So it goes way back to then, right? Um, and perhaps a bit earlier. Remember, we had a state of emergency in 67, is it? Right? Now, we have had four good years of decline after 2010. Uh, roughly, uh, violent crimes caught by 30 plus percent. Um, quite an accomplishment um, to celebrate. And then we had some slippage. And again, there was a bit of panic, and we returned to the control um, narrative. And in the last couple of months, since the appointment of General Anderson, and that's not a biased statement, I didn't go to school with him, uh, <coughs> we have shifted the bit again, if you look at the the, the Gleaner headlines, the Observer, and so forth. And it's about how to sustain the decline. 
That's been the debate since 2010, how to sustain the decline. And one thing is clear in all of that, one thing we ought to be clear on in all of that, we cannot have sustained decline in violent crime without fixing the JCF, without having effective policing, right? And the government is in the process now of um, elaborating a new JCF Act. And uh, I take that as a signal that we are serious about returning to the old issue of how to make the JCF more effective, how to transform it such that it can help to deliver sustained crime reduction and for us to have a more peaceful and just Jamaica. So it's a signal of a return to the idea of police transformation. And I'm hoping that the act will be more than just a signal of that intent that the act itself will become an important instrument of transformation. And I think that is certainly what has motivated me to write the report and motivated me to be making this uh, presentation here. I do not know of a su successful case of police reform without the enablement of legislation. Reform, police reform is a difficult thing when we get to the stage that Jamaica is at now. And most efforts are really up against it, if I may use that term. If the reform effort, more so, if we are talking about transformation, if that effort doesn't take on a legal armor. So this debate, I really invite the general public to become involved in this discussion about the new Police Service Act. For the rest of my presentation, I want to do two things. I want to provide, try to provide a sketch of what this transformed police service ought to look like. And then secondly, selected elements of how we get there. This is just a limited aspect of the report, but I have to discipline my remarks. I can't do everything, right? But I want to stress that is important important to have a vision of the end state that we desire. Uh, you can't get there if you can't imagine it. And I want to come back to, really come back to that point. Our neighbor, Haiti next door is a case in point. Some of you here may be familiar with what policing was like in Haiti under the um, Papa and Baby Doc, Tonton Makoots, right? a set of thugs, basically, with responsibility for law and order that were predators on the population, highly politicized, propping up a family, the rule of a family, and so forth. And then there was an effort after the collapse of, um, of that regime to re disband and reconstitute um, and I had the honor of participating in some of those discussions in Haiti. And I will say this, that when after all the training and discussion about models and so forth, and the new police service was recruited, the new police officers were unable to um, imagine a different way of policing. Their understanding of policing was tonton makut policing. So transformation is a difficult thing. It is possible to dismantle, make serious changes to your police organization and not transform how policing is done. 
So this is where the vision of what you want is important. We have already spent a lot of money, as has been said, about, on police reform in this country, but it's not clear on the type of police service we want, the type of policing that we want. And uh, it's important to learn from the past. This is a slow build-up. If we're in cricket, you'd say it's a long Michael Holding kind of run-up, right? Um, but really, it's, I'm, I'm going to spend most of the time speaking about the, uh, the kind of police service that this act should, if you wish, instigate and enable. So, a little bit of lessons from the past. We, in, by my um, estimate, we have been attempting to reform, transform the JCF in a concerted way, planned way, roughly since 1994. Roughly since 1994. And there have been different ideas about reform and transformation. And the first vision of change was simply modernization. A JCF was operating in a past age. Everything was antiquated, and we simply need to update. It was a kind of technological perspective on change, right? Um, uh, modern computing systems, um, shifting from paper, and all of that, um, issuing traffic tickets that couldn't be enforced because you had no way of tracking it and so forth, right? Um, so simply updating those syst administrative systems um, and getting technological applications to different aspects of policing. Uh, the talk, for example, about application of the forensic sciences and DNA and all of these things dates back before then, right? Um, this is not new stuff. A second perspective on it was professionalization. Now, professionalization, understood in our context, context of policing, means first and foremost, it's first and foremost stands in opposition to politicization, right? Um, and I would say that to a large measure, we have succeeded in depoliticizing, but not quite fully professionalizing, right? And that's an important advance in, in the process. I'll give you a little anecdote that illustrates where we are coming from. Turning point in this was 93. Um, and I'll give you the anecdote, a personal experience I had it was the day after an election. And at the time, I owned a, a small car. And the color, the paint on the car, mm, approximated the color of one of the parties. I won't say which one, right? I wasn't aware of it, driving the vehicle the day after the election, stopped by the police explicit references to the color of the car and so forth, and a bit of harassment because of the color of the car. That's where we are coming from, right? Uh, the changes in the 90s, I think, substantially made advances in depoliticizing, and in that sense, professionalizing. But there are other issues of work ethic, work methods, and so forth, um, again, we have perhaps made some progress there, but not enough. Another image of change is simple sanitization. Just a thoroughgoing anti-corruption uh, campaign um, to remove corrupt elements from the force, get a measure of accountability, um, and on that basis, uh, making the police service a bit more effective in combating crime. Right? Um, problems there that have to do a bit with courage, uh, but also 
with the police occupational culture. And I won't elaborate on that. But the gist of what I'm saying is that we have been kind of muddling through with these three ideas about directions uh, for change and not being thoroughgoing enough. A huge gap in this is that we could do all of these things, modernize, professionalize, sanitize, and not change how policing is done. And I believe that we are at a juncture now where we need to come to grips with that issue. I've seen the policy note uh, that the government sent to the drafting group, and I'm optimistic based on my reading of that policy note um, I got it officially, Minister, right? Not purloined or anything like that, right? Um, <clears throat> and it gives some clear directions. It gives some clues, a sense of this vision of change. And it gets, in my opinion, it gets to the heart. The first time that we are getting to the meat of the problem, which is changing the relationship with the public and therefore how policing is done, right? So there are three aspects to this policy directive from the, uh, from the government. Let me just take a time check, yeah? Um, and the first is that the new police service must be oriented to citizen security, A, B, it must be service-oriented, which we may think of as an element of citizen security, so there's a consistency there, and that um, it must be shaped by what is called intelligence-led policing, right? And I think there is a coherence and consistency with all of these three things. The challenge now is to give these three ideas, three concepts, meaning such that we have a coherent vision of what this new police force um, is likely to be. But the government has certainly done its part in uh, issuing this, um, this policy directive. So for the, I will perhaps just take a few minutes to elaborate some of the aspects of some of these three, three ideas. So citizen security, that idea has been around for a while. Uh, it's a big idea in, the, um, in police transformation in Latin America. Um, and we can understand it in terms of, if you wish, it's opposite. So, uh, <clears throat> Many police services were governed by the old national security doctrine. Uh, the, the role of the police, your armed forces, is basically to protect the political administration, to protect the regime. Sources of threat are invariably seen as internal. Um, these can be political forces. Um, these can be at an earlier stage, especially in our history, the idea of the dangerous classes. So the people were seen as threatening, basically. And you get this politicized uh, police service. And once your police, your police uh, services are politicized, then all kinds of biases set in. And political administrations now have a shoe in to manipulate your, your police services. So there's, on, on this kind of policing, there's very little justice and fairness in policing. So it becomes discredited among the people. It becomes ineffective. It can't um, properly control your crime. So the idea of citizen security then is to remedy that by making your police service serve your citizens. And that can be made very specific, very concrete. It involves a responsiveness to the security needs of the people. It involves elaborating structures that allow them to help to fix the priorities of the police, to hold it directly to account at the local level. Earlier there was talk of the transformation of the old Royal Ulster Constabulary 
into the new Northern Ireland Police Service. And a big part of that transformation had to do with what they call police citizens partnerships. And clear structures were elaborated to help to bring that about at local level. Um, very elaborate, and you have their police and citizens working together to solve crime-related problems as defined by the community. And the second element in it is that it's rights-oriented and therefore respectful of citizens. Um, so those are the two cues there. And related to that, um, it must be, of course, service-oriented, responsive to the needs of the people. Let me give a little example of this. Um, <clears throat> It's perhaps most evident in how police um, regulate traffic. Some time ago, there was a sergeant in charge of a traffic unit at the Constant Spring Police Service. And there was this long line of traffic every evening going into Manor Park Road. And he would get his unit out there, override the traffic light, and ensure that the traffic flows smoothly. In recent times, you may have experienced, I mean, prior to the, the new construction work, but an effort on the part of the police service to assist the public in that way, not to wait at the side of the road or behind a bush for a traffic violation and then to issue a ticket, but to actually intervene and to get a flu smooth flow of the traffic. That is service orientation, right? That is trying to solve problems to make life easier and better for, um, for the citizens. Okay, so um, <clears throat> there is much scope there to specify what these principles mean in the Jamaican um, context. And I think that will have to be an, um, an ongoing uh, project. Finally, on the how-to, two minutes on the how-to. I don't think we can get there without quality leadership. And um, I think the act should specify how we are to get a quality leadership in the new police service and assisting for reproducing the, that quality leadership such that Whenever it's time to, for example, appoint a new commissioner of police, there's an abundance of talent, embarrassment of riches in terms of leadership within the police force. And the dilemma of the uh, police service commission is not whether to appoint someone from inside or outside, but which of these talented exemplary leaders uh, it will appoint. It needs a system for doing that. And there are models, there are examples from various parts of the world. I won't elaborate. If you want to probe it uh, during questions, I'd be happy to elaborate um, then. Second, community um, partnerships. Again, I won't elaborate on that either, uh, but that is key for effectiveness. It's key for performance, right? where the people make demands on the police, hold the police accountable, um, <clears throat> and force them to deliver uh, effective service. And of course, accountability. You can't get change without robust internal accountability and external accountability. Otherwise, you have plans that are just bits of people. People have to be held to account for implementation. So I at least think that these are three critical elements of the how-to. And just like the vision part of it, the report specifies how to have these things um, as part of the new police service act. So in conclusion then, I think it's important for us collectively to develop this vision of the kind of police that we want. I think it's the responsibility of every citizen to participate in that debate and not just sit back and complain after the act. Um, and it's the responsibility of the government 
to set up structures to facilitate that participation, and for the officials involved in the drafting of the act and the policies related to the act to communicate with the people and to have a discussion uh, to make this um, a truly effective and useful uh, process. With that, thank you. Thank you, Professor Harriot. We can now have a robust discussion. I'm going to invite your moderator for the evening to come forward, Joanna Callen from Capri. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Harriot, for that presentation. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Joanna Callen. I'm a research officer at Capri, and I'll be your moderator for the evening. Uh, to invite the panelists up here, Minister Honorable Dr. Horace Chang, the Commissioner of Police, General Anderson, and Professor Harriot as well, and Mr. Roger Malcolm, the Executive Director of Jamaicans for Justice, to come on stage, please. Okay, so to kick start the discussion, the first questions are going to be posed to Minister Chang and General Anderson. The primary issue that we've had on hand is the lack of trust and respect that the public has for the police. It has often been stated that the paramilitary culture of the JCF is to be blamed and that the new Police Service Act is merely a cosmetic change and doesn't address the underlying issue. Further, the JCF has been implementing or trying to implement community policing since the 1990s. How does the legislation for the new Police Service Act really move to change close to 150 years of attitudes and culture that exists within the police organization? Start. Minister Chang. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, Karen. sorry, my apologies. I'm going to actually ask each of the panelists to give a two to five minutes uh, answer to uh, the presentation that we just had a while ago. So, Minister Chang, with you, please. Can you hear me? Speak with the mic. Oh, you can stay seated, sir. Your mic. Can you hear me at the back? Thank you. Yeah, or yourself, the mic. Sorry. Um, <laughs> thank you for that, Christian. All right. The, the new JCF, well, first of all, we are repealing the old Jamaic JCF Act and have a new act. I think there has been an attempt to amend the acts on several occasions, and we don't think that can work. I think that's a good place to start in terms of reforming the police. I really prefer the word transformation or renewal, because the, the police, just as we have to repeal the old act, I want to say the current police force cannot be, cannot be, trans, cannot be changed. We need a new police force. So I want to begin the appropriate. So there are a new act, and literally look at the end there process by which we recruit, train, and organize the police force. And I would just give my stimulating more question to conclude with a statement that I made elsewhere, and no disrespect to Mr. Osborne, but I have used the parallel that we can have a professional military force, and it's come from the same community. The JDF has a high level of respect and credibility, coming from the same Jamaican communities as the police force. And I say that we have to go back to the roots of both organizations. The military force was trained by our colonial authorities. And it was trained as a genuine military force. Because the Britain was still a major power. And this is a major power today. And they had the possibility of always engaging, using their colonial military in military, in military operations. They could not afford to have a second class 
military force working beside the British military. And therefore, the military was efficiently trained, established a good military culture, and we have one of the finest small military operations in the world. The police are completely opposite. I, I use the term that we have never been given a police force. Britain did not give Jamaica a police force. And we need to sit down and think of what do we need as a police force, design it, and execute it. And the real challenge that we have faced there with has been to take that major step and really design our own police force. And that's what this government is looking at under the JCF Act, is to really set about drawing on the expertise and the professionals that we have in Jamaica and if necessary consult with ourselves, but in a very short time. But if we take too long, we'll go back to the old ways. There's a whole pile of documents and proposals. We, even if we make mistakes, what I will assure you of, this government is going to do something about it, right? We are not counting the perfect, but we're going to take the steps to begin the process, and we'd like to conclude it, of really giving Jamaica a professional police force that we can be proud of and really be committed to executing what is a top priority in our budget. The government has a global policy framework. We have decided what we think we should do and what we should not do. And the first response we view is public safety and an efficient law enforcement agency is our number one priority. Thank you very much. General Anderson, we'd like to respond to the presentation. OK, sure. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, it's good. But first, let me just recognize that I have a lot of my officers here in the audience. Um, listening and watching, you're, you're really central and key. We are stakeholders in all of this discussion around the new Police Act. So work has been done on this since for about a year plus now, um, because starting largely in the late 2016 at this attempt. I mean, in there were previous iterations of it. and. The danger has been thus far that the old act is looked at to see how you're going to use legislation to fix the, the police force. From the police force perspective, what you've seen is how do I use legislation to fix the police force? It's just coming from different angles. And what I mean is externally, Persons have had various interactions, seen various things about the JCF that they don't like, so they try to, through legislation, fix it. Internally, uh, members have seen a lot of deficiencies in how their welfare is taken care of, how their promotion systems work, all of these issues, the human issues that exist within the force that they are also trying to fix through legislation. A slew of the discussions are around management issues that are now being tried to be fixed through legislation. That's not what we need. What we need to do is describe the force that Jamaica needs. Set the legislation for that. And then that is what the new legislation needs to be. And it's very easy, and I've been in a number of the discussions, not just since being here, but before. It's very easy to go that you start in a process and then you end up in this discussion about what happened last week that you're trying to fix. And that's, that's a dangerous path. So I'll say that um, by way of opening. But there's, there's a whole lot more to that, that perhaps we can come to later if you wish, uh, that I can say about that. Uh, and I'll just finish on this. The issues that face the police force are a lot more sophisticated and nuanced than I think people give credit for. It's easy to go and do something and end up in a few years back where we are until we understand that beyond structures and, and, and systems, the, there is no pool of Jamaicans that 
is exclusively recruited from to become police officers. They are the same people that we recruit for elsewhere. So they have the same potential for good and for bad as everyone else in the society. So the questions of what some of the issues are have to be looked at in a far more nuanced and sophisticated way. Thank you very much, General Anderson. Mr. Malcolm? Uh, sure, thank you. And thank you for inviting me. Um, I have a few comments on what Professor Harriot said and potentially a few suggestions also for areas that could be incorporated. I'll just start with a general preface that obviously in the line of work that JFJ is in, we are faced with the worst um, allegations of you know, state misconduct. And so our perspective oftentimes comes from one that is potentially even extreme. Um, but the basis of that is not to say that to denigrate or demean um, the force, it is to present examples of what can go wrong when systems are not in place to prevent those things from going wrong. That's a general preface. And so the first general thing that I would think that we would need to have in a police service act, if it's truly to be rights-based, is to establish human rights standards within the legal framework. Those human rights standards don't exist right now in the, in the Conservative Force Act because our police force at the time was never created with a human rights perspective in mind. And when I say human rights perspective, that doesn't mean protecting alleged criminals. That means respecting right to life. That means protecting people from rights violations as just a regular part of policing. And so what we have right now is our human rights standards are in our constitution. And in certain, in certain aspects, they're given statutory frameworks. I would think in one era, we must have clear human rights standards must be in the police framework because the constitutional standards are very vague and very general. But the human rights standards for policing are very specific. And this does not involve reinventing the wheel. The police has elaborated quite well its own human rights standards for use of force, for public interaction, for use of firearms, that are part of binding use of force policies and force orders from the police. However, when those force orders are breached, there is no ability for external accountability because they have no force of law. And so if the police use of force policy, for example, articulates a use of force continuum, de-escalation, when you can use force, it is up to the police to then internally police themselves for that use of force policy, when that could be integrated in broad strokes in a legal framework. And so from Jamaican social justice's perspective, that's the first general principle. What's good about police, poli police human rights policy needs to be reflected in the law. And the second general thing, and don't let me go too long, um, is as, as something that's been alluded to, the, there's a general challenge with the standards for the discipline and promotion of officers by the Police Services Commission for a number of reasons. Either that commission abdicates its responsibility to the commissioner or it doesn't read its standards for promoting officers quite well. And if the proposal that Capri has is to merge the Police Civilian Oversight Authority and the Police Services Commission, one element of that merged body should be a modern set of standards for the discipline and promotion of officers. And I'll give you two examples why that's important. Um, we have no less than three clients who are police officers presently in judicial review proceedings against the police for decisions around dismissal and promotion. We have no view on whether or not the decisions are good, but we have a view on whether or not they're arbitrary because the standards aren't clear. Similarly, there's a litigation at Privy Council right now between Jamaicans for Justice and the Police Service Commission about the same issue, which could be resolved quite easily by improving the standards in the law. And then my final point will be, I think there should be a segregation of pretrial detention from the police to the correctional services. Right now, a large aspect of the police's attention is managing police lockups for months upon a time for persons who are detained when you have an entire correctional service that can do that. But and there's no legal framework for the management of police lockups because that was inadvertently repealed when the correctional, uh, correctional Act was, Corrections Act was passed and the regulations for police lockups were, were repealed. And so we're existing in a space where pretrial detention lockups don't have a clear legal framework, though they did have one in 1980. And so an aspect of a revised police service framework should be what role do we want the police to play in pretrial detention? Do we want the police to also be a detainee management service in a long-term setting? Or do we want the police to only use detention as a last resort and the specialized services for detainee management fulfill that function? Those are issues we need to grapple with if we are really designing a police force that is responsive to the realities that we face. And I'll leave my other points for the question and answer. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Malcolm. So Slido seems to be on fire this evening. So I'm going to take the first question from the audience. Uh, given the rates of attrition of 500 per year, what strategies will be put in place to attract and keep the best minds in the police service? Commissioner or Minister Chang? OK. Um, uh, thanks. Uh, so the, the thing about attrition is it becomes concerning when it starts to spike, or it starts to, to transition upwards, uh, and it's, then that's where you have attrition problems. When you have steady state attrition, then that's just setting your training requirements um, and your development requirements and your capacity. So you know if you're expanding, then you need plus your attrition rate, attrition rate plus. If you're contracting, then um, obviously it goes the other way. Now, so one is to build out our training capacity. The second one is to start talking about flow rather than retention or both. So there's a certain flow rate you're going to have through your organization, which is healthy and likely to, to be. Now, so, so it's not in of itself a recruit, whether it's 500 or whatever it is, it's not in of itself a bad thing, especially if those 500 people are moving into the general economy to take up jobs and do things that are worthwhile and useful. We train as an organization, not just for our force, but for the country. And so it's not necessarily a bad thing. Now, we are working, obviously, on how do we maintain, in, in an environment, we obviously need more police officers. How do we get the delta, the 500 plus, what we need, and build up those numbers uh, to sufficient amounts, but also the right sort of things that address some of the issues that are raised. Um, so we are expanding our training capacity, you know, in, in a word. So that's how we'll deal with the attrition. As I say, it's not so much attrition as a pejorative thing. It's attrition as a flow thing. Right? I don't know if that answers. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so I'll be taking another question from Slido. So, sorry, one thing I'd add to that. Would it be, and I'd be interested to get your view, Commissioner. The, in other professional legislation, training and professional development have legal effect in that there are minimum requirements for promotion based on the attainment of professional standards. They are, even though you don't want to prescribe a whole curriculum in a law that would be inappropriate, there are, for example, requirements for that to progress to a certain level, one must be certified with these certain competencies. And a professional training school or police academy does those things. Right now, much of that is relegated to the police rules. Um, some of it is in the rules, not much. And it has no place in the legislation. Is it, I'm just curious, do you think that aspects of training and professional development which give rise to the flow should be legislated? Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting because it's rare that it is. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, it, you know, most places actually just do that as a function of your management and how you cause the organization to sustain. And this, the danger is for all of these things is legis over legislating mm -hmm. uh, things. Proper management will provide for training. What we're doing is building out mm -hmm. in a sustainable way. The problem is, is that the training hasn't been consistent and certain. That's, that's, that's one of the problems. So you get some, um, people cannot define a clear career path within the organization. And it's reflected back in the promotion issues. The, the challenge with the promotion issues are fundamental challenges of establishment as well. And structure, establishment that says that a person, it, the, there's, a, there's an overall establishment for the force, but formations within the force do not have an establishment. And what that means is that two people will have legitimate calls on one promotion. And once that happens, I probably, I don't know if, it, if you want me to elaborate a little bit on that, but once that happens, somebody is going to feel as if the reason why the other person got it is nepotism or corruption, even if there's none. 
And if, if you want, I can explain very quickly what I mean. We have somebody in the forensics department, an inspector. He leaves. He leaves the force. The sergeant who's now taking up that work in forensics has a legitimate call for that promotion. All other things be equal. The, well, what has happened is, in fact, that an inspector has left the force. The senior sergeant, all things being equal, has a legitimate call on that post of inspector. Which one is correct? Who knows? The point is that there are some, and this is, uh, I just make a, whether you understand or not, the, 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 the point I'm making is that these are, there are some fundamental structural issues that create a problem in the organization that will not be solved through just legislation. We have structural work to do, fundamental things that can cause a transparent promotion system. But also, when I recruit, what's the career path? Well, it depends because if, there, if, if you don't have an establishment in a formation, what is your career path in forensics? Well, you don't know. You may go, you may do the job as a corporal, you may do it as a sergeant. Depends on where the vacancy, if I can take one from over here and give it to you over there. So this, these are some of the realities that our officers face internally, which makes life very difficult for them to be, for it to be predictable and that they know clearly what to do to advance themselves. So these are, these are some of the challenges. They're a little more nuanced. Well, sure. um, the, yeah. Moro, Go ahead, if, I, if, if I may make a comment here. I believe you see that in every one of these important issues, the problem of reform transform is going to arise. OK? So <clears throat> if we take the problem of fear promotion, and uh, the absence of an establishment in the way that it is understood, uh, which is the point that the commissioner was making a while ago of who can make a legitimate claim on a post, right? Um, part of that problem has to do with the fact that the JSDF is a general police service, right? And uh, the idea is that I, I would guess if you can lead an operation out in St. James, then you ought to be able to lead a complicated investigation or lead the, the CIB, which is responsible for investigating complicated crimes, um, or lead any part of the JCF. In other words, the JCF is structured to produce generalists as leaders and generalists as operatives and generalists as managers, right? So you, this, that's part of this problem. Um, there are different ways of fixing that and it takes us back to the vision of our security setup, broadly put. Um, maybe a better way of discussing this would be what models do we have? What configuration of policing do we have? Um, is MOCA going to be an investigative police in that tradition of investigative police services as we understand it, be it an FBI, or they call it various things in Latin America and so forth? Um, is the new police service going to be a paramilitary police uh, if so, on what model? Um, uh, RCMP, Carabineros of Chile. Um, once you begin to think about it in, in, in those terms, then you can have a discussion about the requirements for executive leadership, the requirements for management, the requirements for to be a supervisor, and the requirements to be an expert in the various fields, right? And once you sort that out, then there are career paths, just like how in the university, 
uh, if you wish to be vice chancellor, there's a career path. You know, you must be dean and so forth, and there's a trek up. Some people prefer to just remain classroom teachers or researchers with, with no ambition to be any of these administrative things, right? So it's, it's the big picture that, I, I mean, I can't make sense of these things without an understanding of the big picture. And that's, um, let's, let's reinforce something that is coming out. That the, 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 what Professor Hyatt started on the question of the police was a general service. In fact, it has created far more problems than was even alluded to. In fact, the police service, police force, and I, I use this, avoid the word service in this case, what we have converted the police force into is like a civil service organization and impacts the, it's, it's like part of the general government civil service. Impacts everything we are talking about and from the established, lack of establishment, you have one big, it's like a department. The, the whole salary scales, the remuneration and career path because the challenge of a police force in Jamaica is very complex. It's a simple story. In, in creating it, we have to look at the challenges as well. You need elements that will have paramilitary skills when we have 1,600 murders a year. But we need people who have to deal with domestic violence, who have to be almost social workers, because they're going to deal with people who are having serious social problems and dysfunction. And you need a police element who can deal with that effectively. Because they're going to be meeting kids in school who are going in getting violent, what is the problem? The father might have been killed by a gunman. The mother is surviving and marginal side. You have that element of the police. In addition to that, we need police officers who have to be sophisticated um, professionals in computer science and mathematics and analysis because we are dealing with transnational criminal organization which has heavy funding, doing serious logistic business with drugs, guns, and transnational um, you know, all kinds of transnational crime and trafficking in persons are major issues and money laundering. So, although a small country, we have to create a highly sophisticated police org organization. And I think we have to look at what do we need to get that in place and also to give the experts in their satisfaction professionally. And that comes to the establishment. Somebody who is an expert in cyber crime and dealing with the whole electronics business from not only from scamming but real sophisticated stuff has to have certain professional skills and you have to create within the force a career path for that individual. Like, there's no point in taking him training cybercrime, electronics and all the other technical requirement and you keep him a concept because the top job in that is maybe a sergeant and then to promote him you make him a senior soup in operations which he has no interest in and no skill in. So there's a number of things I have to go to, and as I think the allusion is, look at the challenge we have, then create the legislation to framework, the framework, legislative policy around, um, framework around that in order to build the police force. And within that framework, we're going to provide opportunities for them to have a career path. It may be in section of the force, you don't require a deputy commissioner. You may require someone to pay that level of a deputy commissioner but not necessarily the title of a deputy commissioner because you need the skill set to do that. And you go right across the world in foreign six, I said, modern transnational enterprises, police operation in the field to the community policing that we need so, to, we, we, we need so heavily. And uh, if we can begin to think like that, which is why I really said at the beginning, I don't think we have had a, a police force relative to Jamaica. I give the term that we have had. And I said, notice what we inherited a glorified security guard system which was largely designed to protect property of property owners. We, 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 we trained them for six months in military drill, gave them some discipline, gave them a big pine button and a lean field rifle. And then we complained that they shoot or beat up somebody. Ridiculous. I mean, that's all they have been taught to do. Now we have to reorient that, retrain, and restructure the force to accommodate our young professionals who are interested in law enforcement. A large body of people out there who would like to create a police force that will provide a foundation for law enforcement and which we can really build a safe society and one in which people feel comfortable moving around. We have the people out there, we have the personnel. Mm -hmm. I, as the level operator, must provide a legal framework of what is for a legal armor. I must provide the policy 
and we have to reorient our financing. Okay, all of this is going to cost money. It's going to cost money. I have to build it. Commissioner wants a new trade academy. I have to put the commitment there. And the only thing I can say is that we are looking at that. We have made the priority. We don't have all the money, but we are putting investment in the security force and in particular the police force. Right. Okay, and right. just, just briefly, so there's a, there's a point I think that Dr. Chang just made, and the, what he described was the challenges with a, the national police force. That's really the only police force in the country. Right. It does everything. Everything law enforcement is done by the JCF in, in Jamaica. And it's, it, so it, in comparisons of forces, to look at, it's, it, you, you miss something when you compare it either with a city police force or a regional police force, regardless of how big those are. It's, it's a different thing. And since we don't have a uniform country, then I don't know that we'll have a uniform policing. It's really horses for courses as we design it. Okay, thank you. So as we're discussing specialization and promotion, we have a question from a number of audience members, which is how do you plan to improve the quality of police officers recruited when the salary is not attractive and the qualification requir requirements are not very high? Okay. Um, first, first, let me say that the, the, the quality of police officers recruited is actually quite high. And I, I'll say that. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have huge talent in the force, lots of talent. And, you know, it's interesting. We have a number of officers here who've turned up to see this. They're interested in this. I'm not talking about gazetted officers who there are some, but I'm talking about rank and file members who are interested in this, uh, so this discussion. Mm -hmm. um, so there is talent in there. And I guess the retention aspect of it, which I did probably didn't go in, I know I was saying flow and all that, but the fact is we have to do, we actually have to retain some of those good people. Well, the, the good people are going to be ambitious and they're going to want to move. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a framework for their career development. They have to continue to develop and be promoted, etc. And so we need a framework and a police force that allows for that. Um, so, you know, uh, how do we get in now? When, you, when that question is asked, they're looking at perhaps comparing the police who come in with other people, other sectors, etc. Same. We, we recruit, I recruit head boys. I recruit people with degrees. We have people who, it's what we do with them internally and how we manage these resources after they come in that sometimes creates the disappointment and how, why they will feel disenfranchised, etc. Because you come in expecting one thing, and when you get it, you get stuck. We have to find a way to allow those people to rise and to become unstuck and start leveraging their talent towards a better force and obviously better, better outcomes with the country. Can Great I, trust. A short comment on this. That question reflects the current reality and perception of our police force. Mm -hmm. It is it's not a real question that, as the commissioner indicated, we recruit maybe better talent than many of the other areas. We have teachers, college graduates coming to the force. We have, and join us constables. And why I made that kind of remark about need for a new force is that, as opposed to what we have had the culture, what we have because this is the perception of the police force. Said, you know, when I say it, the I say, you know, I'm being a little bit mischievous in talking about criminal authority. The police force is projected as a group of security guard people who walk with a gun and a button to beat up people. And we have a responsibility to change that because the men and women of the forces that are talented, they have the same commitment to this country as every other. And it's not just a matter of salary they're living. It has become very contentious while it is not necessarily the best salary. It's become contentious because the only thing they can look for in the force is a paycheck. And the time they're spending there to get some time to go advance your CV. Because many of the brightest police officers, you will find they take the time out to get a degree in law, in economics, in logistics. And then they leave because they end up, you end up with corporals having two degrees. You have a corporal who will have a 
first degree and a good quality, honors degree from UWI, not necessarily from a, one of our lesser known universities. Then they get a master's in government or public policy. And there's still a corporate have to wait maybe 10 years to get promoted. And, and we have no in training reference. There's no school in which we can, like a police academy, a person can go or the equivalent of a master's in policing there, they are interested in. These are issues which we have to deal with and say we, are look, uh, we have been advised by, I think we have an extended commissioner and other leadership in the force, and the government is committed to making some of those changes, but we, we don't see ourselves as being the exclusive um, you know, reservoir of ideas and force. And I've said many other things have gone before. Some were good, but maybe even to were a bit of a veranda talk because nobody thought there's a government would do the right thing and make the radical change we want. That's one of the reasons I'm very pleased with this presentation this evening, because Catherine and Prof. Patrick will bring a level of intellectual rigor that has not characterized all the research we've had in policing. And we need a lot more of that, and for individuals to think broadly and positively, because we're going to make changes, we're going to make the commitment, we're going to find redirect resources to ensure we can give this country a highly professional skilled force. We have the person, we just have to create the institutional arrangement and the legal framework. And, and that's why this question I said is coming, that, that is really how we have seen the police. I said, like a glorified group of security guards, they, they are much better than that. We recruit some of the best people in the country. But and we don't keep them. Can comment if you, so if ahead, you don't mind. Uh, I read into the question an assumption that perhaps money can solve this problem, right? And I, I just want to make a cautionary note here. Other countries have thrown a lot of money, and I can name one, Trinidad and Tobago, billions of dollars at improving its police service. And the Trinidadian police service by performance and by the survey data that is available is not doing much better now than before all of those billions of oil money was put into it, no. fixing <laughs> every station. No and Trin if you see those police stations in Trinidad and so forth, right? SUVs, right? Top-end SUVs and so forth. Um, mobile forensic units, you name And after a while, they're just parked, yeah. right? Um, so a cautionary note there, yes, we must invest, put our taxpaying dollars, but it will take a lot. That's the easy part, believe me. Can I just start on the hog the show in a position here, but when I say invest, we're going to invest along the lines indicated. I'm not looking at solving the problem. As I said, salary is not the only problem. It has become the main problem because, I said, the average policeman can also see the paycheck. He doesn't see a career, he doesn't see a service, he doesn't see any kind of satisfaction in this job because he's beaten up on. He is, I said, he has a 26-year-old double master's and he's, when he walks the street in the Red Sea, them, what kind of man him? He may, have a, he may have a crook or a brutal character, you know, instead of being seen as someone who is young, capable, and about to make a positive contribution to the country. And therefore, when I say, but all of what he's saying requires funding. So I'm just reassuring that right. I would, but that funding is not just to go out there to solve the problem. Let me give you one simple example to end on. And I've been told in the commission, say, like, you have a divisional headquarters. That's the police major operational unit in a, in a parish and in a region. There are 19 of them, all right, Commissioner? 19 divisions. But if you go to a divisional office, the first place you enter to talk to a policeman is what they call a guard room. Small, box-like, literally, in the regional headquarters. And therefore, imagine my imagine, you imagine a domestic abuse case. So the girlfriend walks in to talk to a police officer. Standing less than six feet away from her behind her, the boyfriend looking at her with an ugly face and cussing her. As what will happen when she comes home. There's nowhere that you can receive the, com the, the client who is coming in to take them somewhere quietly and talk to them. If, if, if it gets bad, the, the, if there's a call, if it's in the day and there's a sergeant or a cop nearby, they might say, call the CIB officer, make her take her around the CIB office somewhere in there, and when you go to the CIB office, they have a table and a, a bench, and which is broken. In what, they, they just know where to receive and talk to them. I'm saying, money needs to fix that. The police, a divisional police station needs a reception area with areas they can discuss with people in confidence that anybody in Jamaica can feel comfortable walking there, the poorest to the richest, and make a complaint 
and feel they're talking to a professional person who can list their complaint, deal with it, and if the person wish to walk behind them because you're free to walk, and if it's a domestic abuse, boyfriend or their customer, they detain him and put him somewhere else. Then the, the, the woman can feel comfortable that she has got a fair hearing, and you're not that is a policeman friend, and therefore they're going to get beat up and go back home because she just going to walk out. In other words, the police station itself, the money spent, must create a new atmosphere, a new reception, a new kind of station where the community sees it as a place where they'll go to deal with legal, lawful issues. That's, that's what I say. And that's what I say. Dub the police salary, give them some new car, train the same amount, and put them out there, and the car's mash up by next year, and the police station run down, and it gets paid, and inflation catches them, and suddenly finds that what he could buy with hundred thousand dollars last year, next year suddenly find him gone back to fifty thousand dollars. The whole thing falls apart. The police fixing the police force is part of fixing the entire institutional service of the country and we have to put it all together. But we are committed as a unit to try and as a government to work with those who understand the field and to build ourselves a police force that is effective and efficient in Jamaica. Thank you very much, gentlemen. So our next question is, we're discussing all of this reformation, trying to reach to a new place with the police service legislation, but what plans are being put in place to improve the, on the measures of corruption, to reduce corruption in the police force? I think I should best comment on that. Look, corruption has become a part of the ecosystem of the force not only because there might be individuals who are intricately corrupt, the whole structure of the force lends itself to that. So when the commissioner refers to the lack of a career path, you literally end up with, you will end up with corruption inevitably in the system. Not only because of Sally, but what you end up with, a batch of a thousand people join the force. The majority of them bright young people. They still know where you're going unless you begin to, so you end up with the best ones go, expand the CV. And the opportunities will change in the entire time they might do too much, but they expand the CV, get a degree, maybe a double degree, and they see a job. So they go on to Bank of Nova Scotia, they migrate, or they join the force in Cayman, or they join the force in Bermuda, or they go to the UN. UN recruits the Jamaicans. We have good quality top policemen, especially women. They all have gone to the UN. They get double salary and they're gone. So you have some of your most enterprising, quality leadership leaving you. One or two escapes is going to go up. Others say here, they can't get promoted because they're not friendly to the superintendent. They don't have a, a political friend to support them. They don't see any way of studying to get up the ladder. So they get frustrated. And in fact, the only ones who would get caught up in some kind of the gray area, so to speak, are not necessarily, you, you have people who are, the corruption needs from just figure out taking a blight or something on the side and it should be right because my salary is weak and if I buy a bus and run it, it's not a big thing. They're not doing anything elite, um, anything that is criminally illegal, but it detracts from their force and disrupt the operation. They'll do that. Others will, might even get caught up in the criminal system. There are police officers, transnational criminals have billions of dollars. In, 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 in the town I come from, there are people in scamming who talk about earning earn 500 told us for the month, and that's a reduction in their earning, and they are a bit disappointed, so next month they have to make more, and that's, I mean, 500,000 US dollars at any time, and, and there are people transporting money on boats now from the other way, so you send up a boat, boatload of a ganja or coke, and come back with a boatload of money. The young people who are forced, find themselves in a frustrating, unappe unappealing situation, working in an office that they can't even find a chair at, that even be sent to their facility. It is easy to get caught up in this. They have bills to pay, they have kids to So in other words, the professional pride loses any meaning for them. So the ecosystem creates an opportunity for corruption. There will be the outright, almost assassin who will join the gang, literally. But you have a lot of people who get caught in the ecosystem. And if we change the ecosystem in the force, you will end up finding there's a lot less challenges. Mm -hmm. It's a force of 14,000. They'll always be the corrupt individual, but rather it become the label of the individual. I'm a physician, they have been doctor, physician who have been charged with highly unprofessional, unethical, and criminal behavior. 
there have been pastors who have been charged. So every profession have their deviant. What has happened in the force is that we have created a force in which the ecosystem is such that it's almost become dominant. If you see a policeman, pretty much like we see a parish council or something, the political is that we must be doing something wrong, right? If we change that ecosystem, we'll have a different police force. Uh, see what we have to change the political system. <laughs> Admit that as well, right? Mr. Malcolm, you want to respond? Yes, so um, yeah, I think Minister Shang is correct. It's an ecosystem, and it happens across the board. Obviously, with the police, the impacts are way more profound because of their police powers, monopoly on violence, and ability to detain. If I could distill corruption into four settings, I think that we can, can't stamp out corruption through legislation, but we can make the environment less enabling. So the first is corruption's function as corruptions exist as a function of the ability to deprive liberty in one sitting. So for example, it is possible under the Constabulary Force Act for the same officer to suspect you of a crime, detain you of that crime, and then deny your station bail. All the same person in one day, same go which that installation of functions enables detention fairly easily because the Constabulary Force Act never contemplated segregation of oversight of detentions. So what you happen is that a ballooning detention population in there, some of which don't need to be there or need to be detained, would create an incentive for detentions where persons can pay out of detentions or do things retributively using the power to detain because it's legally possible. The second aspect of the detention that, that breeds corruption is because Again, I keep speaking about the spiritual detention because there is no clear content vision as to do we want the police to fully manage the spiritual detention or should it be remand centers? What happens is arbitrary rules are imposed at different police stations depending on how, in, how much integrity the commanders have. And so we give an example, state of emergency or regular. I get detained and, my, and Suzanne wants to bring me food. She's my mother. The police will say, no, at this station, we don't accept any visits on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, and you can only bring food on a Thursday. But throughout the week, you can buy the food from the canteen down the road, which we have established, and we will charge you money to bring the food. It's a real example. It happens all the time. And so what happens in state of emergency particularly is that one of the police stations upped the cost of box food because more people were being detained. Again, no, this is, it's, it just will happen to anybody. It's not a unique to police. It's not unique that they are more corrupt, but what happens is that there is a, enable, is a legal environment that enables it because there is insufficient segregation of policing duties and other duties that don't need to be policing duties. So we have remand centers for the purpose of pretrial detention, but they can't hold enough people. So the police end up doing the work of remand centers de facto, and it breeds an opportunity for corruption fairly easily. I will finish soon. The other area is the promotions. The reason why I asked the question about do we want to legislate in with more precision the factors to consider in professional development, though we can't legislate a career path, I fully agree with that, is because many officers view the promotion process as not being legally certain. And because it is not being legally certain, because the factors are not legally precise, this is the one small reason, there is an allegation of corruption, even when corruption doesn't exist, because the legal framework for promotions is simply not precise enough to defend against allegations of corruption. And so even when corruption doesn't exist, the perception can foster, police federation can bring application judicial review, because there aren't sufficiently precise legal standards relevant to certain career trajectories within the police force. I mean, and, and so, I mean, just last week, there was an application on judicial review where the court agreed that the decision to dismiss was arbitrary and that it is a function of insufficient legal precision in the, le in the law. And so that can be avoided, that contention, even if you don't agree that it exists, that contention can be avoided if you improve the legal precision for how, promote, how traction without the force is maintained. And I'll, I'll pause there. I've, I've distilled it into four areas. But that's... You, if you break down the corruption into different areas, you can change the enabling environment for it through legislation and then ameliorate it. Not remove it, but ameliorate it. Thank you very much. So can I add a little bit to that? Sure. And then we'll take a question from the audience. So the, the, the problem is with the existing framework, existing you can't let issues the within the force around establishing regulate. Law. Even if you had a clear legal framework, you'd run into the same problem at the moment. Um, but it doesn't take away from what you're saying. I'm just saying that the, the foundation work to do that, to set that on, isn't yet done. Um, the, the other point I want to make is that um, the, the whole 
this, the corruption issue is, is an interesting one. I've spoken about it before. When, it's, when an officer has to beg things for the station, for the station to be able to survive properly, or to have chairs, or to have paint, that's called innovation. <laughs> when they ask for a can of paint for their house, that's no corruption. Now, even when they beg paint, etc., for a station from businessmen, when those businessmen have a conflict with the law, it becomes problematic for the officers. And so that creates what you're doing is teaching people that this is the correct way of doing it. And I do not blame for a second the officers who have innovated in terms of keeping their surroundings properly in an environment when the resources are not there to do it. What you're going to do, stay, sit down in, in, in broken down chairs. You, if you have any sort of regard for your officers, you're going to try and do something. And you will engage businessmen. You, know, you probably won't take illegal funds or anything, but you're going to engage who you think can help you. And they fix up the thing and all that. But we set the person on a dangerous path when we do that. And it's a path that creeps and creeps until first you get used to acquiring through a method. And then the method becomes useful to you personally. And it bleeds over. And all of a sudden, you started saying, well, you'll never, you are not into corruption. And you find yourself over here looking back. And things have shifted and you wonder how you get out of the hole. These are just some of our, the realities of it. As I'm saying, it's more nuanced than that. It's not, does they have a corrupt, corrupt set of people and a non-corrupt set? It's not, it doesn't work quite like that. So, so when you hear the commissioner refuse to take a car <laughs> from somebody who's giving him, those are the police commissioners, but so the policy, <laughs> if you give the police, then you give it through the central office. Because what they're saying is a real problem. It, and it goes, and, and everybody, anybody give, they support the station, they give them food, they give them care, they give them tires, they give them gas, but they want them to come to the airport, come to them host, come guard it after that. And then it goes on and on. A real, what the other is, an extreme issue, and I was intervened because I said, the country and I'm part of the government have to decide how we're going to maintain our police force. So I said, it goes beyond just the paycheck. We have to provide the force a atmosphere, not just the legal ecosystem and the general professional ecosystem, but even their physical environment must provide facilities to enforce the law. You cannot have police officers in a place where they, tell it. they have no talents. And we have stations like that. It's ridiculous. So we have to provide the funding and the system to do it in a credible and sustainable way. OK, we're going to be taking a question from the audience. We're hearing you, <laughs> all right? Otherwise, this crisp and clear, so. All right, my name is Zara Burton. I'm a reporter, and I would love to just kind of get if there are, if this is possible, no, or if you could give us maybe a slide or two to figure out what exactly is the, I guess the overarching changes that will take place as a result of this act. Um, what I'm not getting from this seminar, despite how long I've been listening, is this is the change versus this. This is the change versus this. This is the timeline for when we will be finished with the sensitization and the, um, you know, I'm not getting enough from the session regarding the changes. That's one question. Second question is on the issue of police moonlighting, police working in private security jobs while also owning private security firms. Will that be addressed in this act? Again, it goes back to the original question, which is what are the changes versus what exists? And in the last question, geared toward Major Anderson, is the issue of, maybe unrelated, but political representatives 
ordering hits on civilians. And I'm asking the question, if you've ever come across that in your tenure so far in terms of policing, and also if it were supposed to come across your radar, how would you deal with that? Okay, um, let me answer the last one first. No, I haven't come across it. And when people break the law, they, they become criminal and criminally liable. You have the comment there. Yeah. All right. You have to take the first. <laughs> Go back to the other question. You have to the, well, you have the comment on the other. You can go on. Mr. Yeah. Tang, please. All right. Um, but here is, first of all, I think the commission indicates to you legislation is not what only will fix the police. All these issues you're in, your second question, don't need legislation. They already established good practices that if the leadership of the force is effective, and in place properly, they will cease. Policemen are not allowed to have security guard firms when they are active police officers. They are not allowed to moonlight. It's against the force orders. And therefore, once these matters come to the attention of the commissioner, he has the authority to act on it. And that clearly, and I am confident, this commissioner will make the required steps to take the required step to correct those errors, because that's part of the problem that is destroying the force which we have indicated clear in the comment. Look, you're not, the police force is indicated, and I said the term, we don't have a, the culture that was of the force is not built on a police force in the sense of a small national police force. It was basically a glorified security guard initially, and we have used it for, uh, you have right to make you to get an, a CV. There's no cliche to demonstrate the changes. And we're not gonna give you a, you know, Transformation I mean, we have used all kinds of terms to do that. What we are telling you, and I repeat, we are, the act itself will just create what is an appropriate legal framework for a modern police force. And uh, you want details, you'll have to look at the act as we come out of it, because to try and put that in a discussion of this sort is almost impossible. You have, you have heard features of it mentioned. There's no kind of all embracing two sentence tell you that. That's the kind of clear. Easily, if you want to be. And a political platform, I can give a couple of nice comments and it will sound good, but it, that's, that has gone before. In terms of the organized the force, the issues of training is a very complex issue. The issue of establishment, establishment is a very boring thing, but we need highly professional personal officers to come and lay out the structures. The issue of the specialization, how we treat them. So they're complex issues which cannot be put in some kind of nice short term to be repeated, the 730 news. And the country have to be prepared to work with us all I can give you is that the policy of the government is to create as a first priority is to find the required institutional changes, the legal framework, and to put the required funding in to create a police that can generate public safety and efficient law enforcement. That is a basic philosophical sentence. And we are here as part of the discussion that we can have an open discussion and once we are going to Parliament, before we get to Parliament legislation, it will be an open discussion to look at the various features, and all of those who have an interest can get a chance to make the input. Of course, we'll have to put it together with the legal draft, and the police force and the expertise first. The police problem is a major challenge. It's a complex problem, but we're going to deal with it. Can I say, no, Okay, just one reaction. So. Um, Minister Chang mentions that there are existing good practices, force orders that would disenable or prohibit the situation that you're describing. One thing that I would like to put on the table um, is uh, in preparing this law, contemplating what subject matter is appropriate to delegate to force orders and what should be in law. And I give you an example. Ha having a force order from whenever um, that, that is prohibited means oftentimes very little in practice, at least in our experience, unless there is the energy at the high command to enforce that force order. But the enforcement of that force order is highly variable based on how the fort high command chooses to enforce it. And if the high command chooses not to enforce a force order without even a general um, legal principle in an enabling legislation, it is next to impossible to get external accountability for it. Example, no, but it's true. Example, the force order from 2014 
stating very clear that you can film the police. However, if a police recruit comes to the college in 2018, did not come across that force order, was not trained on it, and did not know that the, legal, the police's legal interpretation is that you can film the police, they go and pepper spray the person last year. Now, obviously, that is wrong, and the police condemns it, but it raises a larger issue of a substantial amount of very important and good practice within the police force is delegated solely to force orders, which people then have to become aware of, and the general principles, sometimes where there should be, are not in enabling legislation. And so I think one thing that would even guide future police commissioners and high command is a clear understanding of what is appropriate to delegate to force orders and what isn't. And it, it, this issue raises that example, even if there's no consensus that that must be in the law. I don't know if it needs to be in the law, but it raises a bigger issue of it's never clear what the police can delegate to itself as force orders and what really is the state's responsibility to put in the legal framework. And I think that's something that we should confront in redesigning the force as well. Can I address two matters? One is that there's an there's a actual very clear framework under which private work can be done uh, and also on how, if you have interest in businesses, how that works. That's, that's actually, there's, a, there's documentation and processes. The, the question um, therefore is they, they surround conflict of interest and what, what that is uh, and so on and w when do you have a conflict of interest and so th those are some of the issues that are addressed through the, the process. Now people find ways around things they, you know, you, they have a company but it's not really in their name they, their, their interest in it isn't obvious you'd have to investigate that to, to find out what it is our the, 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 how overtime works in the police force, the overtime structure is something that has been uh, discussed internally, how we do overtime um, when officers want to do extra work. There's more work than certainly the officers can manage, even internally. And perhaps if we had a strong overtime structure, some of these other, this other move, moonlighting wouldn't happen. So there are two aspects there. One, how you control uh, the thing through and make sure that the, whatever the guidelines are, are followed, but also whether the guidelines are good enough. We probably need to look at that as well. But whether if they are, what they are now, one is they're followed, but also on the other side of it, what is it that we need to do um, to allow for the need that they're filling to be filled, if you, if you understand. It's not unique to the JCF for officers to do other work. It's, it's all over that that happens in, in a number of places. Now it's really just, so we, 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 that's, that's really what we have to, to, um, to deal with in, in regards to this. Thank you very much, General Anderson. So at this stage, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to give a brief two minute closing and we're going to wrap up for the evening. Should we? Okay. Unfortunately, we are out of time right now. It's clear that there's a lot of discussion to take place, but we have to wrap up for the evening. So I'm going to ask <coughs> Minister Chang to give his closing, please. Right, thank you. First of all, let me comment Capri for the forum and the wide interest here from all sections. I, and I, I think there are some very good opinions coming, some differing, the level of legislation we should use. But I just want to say that I do believe we can fix the police problem and fix it fairly quickly. I think we have adequate number of young Jamaicans committed to law enforcement who have given the appropriate institution to operate in. We can create a very professional police force that every Jamaican can feel proud of. And conversely can be done, and I don't think we have to spend time writing even 40 pieces of legislation and everything. Some of that will have to be done by the professionalism that you can establish in that institutional force. And maybe that I'm a lawyer, and I'm not one who is a lawyer by this later. I'm not a great fan of a lot of legislation, I must tell you, philosophically, because I find that at the time they tie up in all, it's the easiest way to tie up someone is to tie up in courts. So, but I do think, even without all the legislation that our human rights were like, we can create a highly professional, highly skilled police force that can deal with the cold complex of criminal activity we have in this country if we professionalize it take out the kind of curriculum of activity that goes in there and give them adequate training, adequate institutional framework to operate it. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Professor Harriot. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> earlier, I mentioned the shift that had taken place in the discussion about crime reduction in the country, um, from control to um, how to sustain the reduction. I think, similarly, a shift is taking place in our discussion about what to do with the police force and policing in the country. It's the first that I've heard senior members of, of government, and Dr. Chang is a very, very senior one, um, say that we really need to fundamentally change policing um, in the country. And I think we all need to cue into that and help to define uh, what this new policing ought to look like and help it to become so. I think there's a role for every citizen in that. Thank you very much. Uh, before we go to General Anderson, Minister Chang has to leave, unfortunately. I want to thank him for his presence this evening. And uh, we would like to... You want to finish? Okay, well, General Anderson, go ahead. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. All right, let me just uh, start quickly. Um, uh, thank Capri. Thanks, really, for this. It's, it's really important. Second, secondly, um, the, for my officers who are here, thank you. Sometimes you, you're in these forums and it seems like they're, you're getting battered left, right, and center. We're going to fix it. We're going to work together and fix it. So don't, don't, don't worry about it. And you're going to be part of the change. Um, the, the next one is that no organization, no organization that has to depend on external oversight for its credibility will ever be credible. We need strong internal oversight mechanisms. We need to regulate ourselves. And then the external oversight just checks. They cannot be doing the oversight. We, to get trust and credibility, we have to deal with our own issues internally, quickly, and effectively. Okay? Um, the other thing is, we, and, and what would address some of the, the, the issues uh, Roger raised is that you can't legislate every situation. What we want are officers who understand their role is to protect citizens. That would change, stop you from doing the pepper spray thing because your, your job is to protect, not to protect yourself from a camera, but to protect citizens. Once you understand your role and you have a sense of pride and worth, you cannot outpay corruption. You cannot outpay it. You can earn your, your year's salary in a day. So it's something else that trips in. It's that the sense of pride and worth and, and the, what the uniform means, what your, your character that stops it. Once you're getting a, once, when, when you go below a living wage, then you create vulnerabilities. But once you hit that level, there's no, you can't outpay it. All right, so I just want to say, just wrap it up, thank, thank, again, thanks, Capri. And as I say, my officers, we will fix it together. Thank you, Mr. Malcolm. Yeah, three quick points. Picking up where Major General Anderson left off, um, strong internal oversight and much to the chagrin, I'm sure, of many such an also needs to be legislated. And so if internal oversight systems should exist, and I agree that they should be the primary oversight, not external oversight, because leadership can change, internal oversight structures also have to have a general legal framework. And second point is that there is a distinction between over-legislating and identifying areas where external oversight would have been needed in the history of the JCF and are needed in the future of the JCF. And so while I don't think everything can be legislated, we can learn from the issues that we have when we leave a lot up to the integrity simply within, inter within the force and not have that externally. The final point is that the mysterious issue of the body cameras needs to also be in the legal framework and there must be a legal framework for that chain of custody. And actually, fourthly, Minister Chang, I hope that the process of consultation is truly participatory and I beg you is not. We have tabled legislation and everybody has two weeks to give comments before debate starts. I hope that is not the approach. Thank you very much to our panelists. I'm going to invite Damian King to come back on stage and give the closing remarks. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, panelists. Uh, there are a lot of great questions on Slido. 
just for those who came in late and may not have realized, um, all the questions that were asked came from the audience, because I know that the moderator prepared some questions ahead of time of, of, of her own, and she didn't ask any of those questions. But all the questions she asked came from the audience. No, all the questions can answer because you ask a lot of questions. <laughs> But what we plan to do is the Capri staff, based on what was said here and from our research, we are going to go through after this and throughout tomorrow and answer some of those questions on Twitter. So you can pay attention to Capri stream because there were some really good questions. The ones that were answered were the ones that you said were the most important ones, the ones that you voted up. Uh, the report that was presented today by Professor Harriet uh, is going to be made available on Capri's website, as all our reports are, as soon as we finalize the report and do some polishing up. Thank you again to the UK's Department for International Development for their commitment to an important area of policy reform in Jamaica. The work that we do would not be possible without their commitment and support. Thank you for the Institute for Criminal Justice and Security at UWI for partnering with Capri on this important work. A huge thank you to Capri's general sponsors. Without the private sector support that we get, none of Capri's work that supports government policy in, on the economy, on social issues, on environmental issues, on governance would at all be possible. And we are hugely grateful to the Jamaican private sector for your support. And finally, thank you for your interest. Refreshments are outside. Have a good evening. Very good moderator. Please don't let the audience delay.